the military has been a crucial peaking resource to help make sure that our health care system doesn't get overstrained. The leader of Canada's opposition echoes calls for military intervention in the Bearskin Lake battle against Omicron. I am asking that you reopen your doors to help our critical services operational. And health authorities in Nunavut are asking everyone to pitch in amid rising COVID numbers across the territory. We're working on an internet connectivity project to actually bring um, fiber and uh, enhance our wireless um, on the reserve. Plus, battling the digital divide. A group of newly trained young people from a First Nation in Alberta are using their IT skills to bring people closer together. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Opposition parties in Ottawa were calling out the Trudeau government on Thursday for failing to act more quickly to help a Northern Ontario First Nation where a major COVID-19 outbreak threatens to overwhelm Bearskin Lake. APTN's Fraser Needham reports. Opposition leader Aaron O'Toole called it absolutely unacceptable. He was responding to the three days since the Bearskin Lake First Nation asked Ottawa for military aid. But as of yet, not a single soldier has arrived in the community. The military has been a crucial peaking resource to help make sure that our health care system doesn't get overstrained. They shouldn't have to beg and plead for deployment of the Canadian Armed Forces. The government and the minister should be on top of this. And More than 50% of the community's 400 residents are infected with the Omicron variant. And its leaders say they simply don't have enough healthy people to perform the simplest of tasks, such as getting wood to homes for heat or delivering food to elders. The NDP has sent a letter to Emergency Preparedness Minister Bill Blair demanding to know what is going on. MP Charlie Angus calls the situation outrageous. As they're watching this community get hammered with Omicron, completely overrun, uh, reaching out to the federal government and saying, we need some help here. Uh, and they're getting the runaround, they're getting these ridiculous responses. The latest I heard was, well, they didn't fill out the forms properly or they didn't officially ask us. Indigenous money. Services says it has sent over $1 million to the Bearskin Lake First Nation to help deal with the crisis. The government says it is working with the community to find out what and how many people it needs to help. But Angus says it is not enough. And if this were a major well, Canadian city, the military would have been there uh, long ago. You know, the mayor of Toronto called the army to come in and shovel the sidewalks for Torontonians so they could get to work, and the Canadian army showed up. Uh, meanwhile, we had a COVID crisis in Keshechewan uh, that we begged the army and Minister Bill Blair for weeks and weeks and weeks to get help, and by the time they came in, uh, it was completely, uh, the community had been completely overrun. And in that time, the public had stepped up, and it's the same thing in Bearskin Lake. Ottawa says Ontario must make the request to send the military to Bearskin Lake. APN News asked Ontario Minister of Indigenous Affairs Greg Rickford if such a request was being acted upon, but we did not receive a response by broadcast time. Fraser Needham, APTN National News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, the Conservatives are calling for an emergency meeting of the House of Commons Health Committee. Canada continues to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says there are critical gaps in how the government is managing the pandemic. He's calling for a more balanced approach with the country's high vaccination rate. But what we found with Omicron, if you actually look in a total way at the data, is you're also going to have some hospitalization and a lower number of ICU admission for people that are fully vaccinated. In some cases, even with the booster, as we're seeing out of Denmark and other, other studies that are literally being watched on a daily basis. So the more we can give all Canadians tools to keep the, the spread down and to keep normalcy to life is what we have to be doing. The House of Commons is not in session until January 31st, but if at least four members of a committee call for an emergency meeting, it can be scheduled. Nunavut began seeing new cases of COVID-19 right before Christmas. Since then, cases have been steadily on the rise, despite the lockdown put in place by the territorial government. 
Our Ken Driscoll has the latest from Iqaluit. Nunavut now has 244 active cases of COVID-19 in 12 of Nunavut's 25 communities. Nunavut's Premier read off the roll call today to reporters at the Legislative Assembly. 48 in Alvin, one in Baker Lake, one in Cambridge Bay, two in Chesterfield Inland, 17 in Idlerik, 72 here in Nihalurin, 23 in Kingain, 19 in Panato, one in Pond Inland, five in Rikit Tabzua, 45 in Rankin Inland, and 10 in Sanaraya. This might be the last time we have such accurate testing numbers. The health department has decided to only do full testing on cases in communities that don't have any positive cases. If you live in a Nunavut community that already has COVID, they're no longer going to do full testing. Nunavut's chief public health officer explains just what is being gained in exchange for the loss of the testing. It frees up lab staff to be to ensure that they're available for other uh, diagnostics that are just as important. The same people who test blood for heart attacks and diabetes and other conditions, including tuberculosis, not blood, but do the test for it, are doing the COVID tests. And if the volume of COVID testing incre continued to increase as it has in the last two weeks, something had to give. Everything but essential government offices are closed. But Nunavut's premier urged one group to turn out for work, daycare workers. I want to make a special plea to Nunavut daycares. We need you more than ever before. I am asking that you reopen your doors to help our critical services operational. Our healthcare workers, store employees, water and waste management workers must go above and beyond to help our territory during this severe wave of COVID-19. Many of these critical services are now close to the breaking point. Staff are exhausted, balancing work as well as childcare, which is unsustainable for many. Since this latest outbreak, Nunavut officials have been saying the healthcare system is near a breaking point. Now, with testing only being done in a limited fashion, it seems like the territory is closer to that breaking point. Kent Driscoll, APTN National News, Halloween. Earlier this week, the federal government and First Nations leaders agreed to settle the largest class action lawsuit in this country's history. The agreement in principle promises $40 billion for First Nations on reserve First Nation on Reserve families affected by the child welfare system still needs to be certified and doesn't include those living off reserve. Jody Callahoo Stonehouse is executive director of the Yellowhead Indigenous Education Foundation. She joins me now to take a closer look at the deal. Jody, great to see you. What was your reaction to the settlement news? You know, it's been a long time coming and I really want to commend Cindy Blackstock and the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, the Assembly of First Nation, Carolyn Buffalo and her son Noah, all the work that's been done by so many uh, regarding Jordan's principal and child and family services. This has been well over 15 years of dedication and hard work and tears and um, we're starting to see the fruits of people's labor and it's really beautiful to see systemic change in my lifetime. What do you think this will mean to families affected by the child welfare system? Well, I think this is a, a kickstart into that healing and reparation process. We know that systemic reform needs to take place, but this will also help acknowledge the trauma and the harm that has been caused by the child and family services system. And now we can talk about and make those changes around how we lift and love and care for our children and our families differently. As you mentioned, uh, Jody, 15 years, that's a, a long time. Why do you think it took this long to get a deal in principle? Uh, systemic racism, juridical and bureaucratic uh, systems that are incredibly slow moving and political will. Well, what do you think should happen here next? Well, this is still uh, just an agreements in principle. 
I think it's going to be time for community members to come together with leadership and imagine what are the ways that we can do things differently and what are the resources that each family is going to need. So start to build that dream, put a price tag to it and have our leadership start to formulate uh, how we might do this systemic reform uh, from our nation's perspectives. Jody, always great to have you with us. Appreciate you taking some time. Take care, Dennis, and Happy New Year. Time now for a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we've got a story you'll want to tweet about. A day-long bird count on Ganawage Mohawk Territory. Well, the Ganawage Environment Protection Office has been participating for a number of years. I'm a birder personally, so I really wanted to come out and help with the count. We'll see many of the same species that we saw last year, the year before, and the year before. All of the information goes into database, and that way uh, scientists are, are able to see the evolution of, of species over time. So far, I, I've observed 42 different species of bird, so it's pretty cool to think that you have that much just in your own backyard. I'm Lindsay Richardson, and I'll have more about this story for the birds coming up soon. Welcome back. 2021 was a rough one on the Métis Nation. Political infighting, allegations of corruption and bullying, and identity issues dominated the news of anything Métis related, from the Métis National Council right down to the provincial governments. The Métis Nation of BC was no exception after a contentious suspension, election, and even an unsuccessful court challenge by the former president the MNBC says it's looking at 2022 with fresh eyes. Here's Melissa Ridgen with new Métis Nation of BC President Lisa Smith. Lisa, well, it's been, it was a tumultuous uh, year, that 2021, for you folks. Uh, it's a brand new year here. What are the priorities for the Métis Nation of BC? Um, we, we have a lot um, that we've done in the past year, even regarding uh, COVID, so we're going to continue working on those. We're currently working on a Métis Nation Equity and Reconcil Reconciliation Accord with the provincial government. We continue to work with the federal government on our self-governing agreement, and that's with the full support of Métis National Council and the three other governing members at that time at this time. So we're, we're very happy to have their support and be able to move forward in, in a bit more of a, a, a quicker fashion. We are behind a bit uh, from the other uh, governing members, but we will be catching up very soon. Uh, Métis Nation BC is the only uh, Métis government in British Columbia. And um, I just want to, to make that very clear. There are, there are, are other Métis organizations, but Métis Nation BC is the government of Métis people in, in British Columbia mm -hmm. and recognized by both the federal and provincial governments. Mm -hmm. Um, we were, I just wanted to ask too, you know, this is certainly, uh, you know, I think that Métis people uh, are, you know, across the country are fed up with a lot of the fighting that uh, we see within the Métis Nation. Certainly onlookers in this country who aren't Métis must be looking at this uh, with a lot of confusion. So how do you see the Métis Nation moving on uh, from all of this, you know, united? Um. We, we are working well at the Métis National Council level. Uh, we've had several meetings already, and we look forward to continuing that working relationship uh, moving forward. Uh, with Métis Nation BC, we are doing a, a campaign for citizenship, trying to encourage as many people as, as we can mm -hmm. to uh, start the application process for their citizenship card. We have 90,000 self-identified Métis in British Columbia, and currently our registry, we have 22,000 citizens. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to bring as many Métis people home as we can um, to our nation. Is the, and, is the uh, citizenship requirements that you have in the Métis Nation of BC, are those the same uh, requirements that, say, you know, the Manitoba Métis Federation would have, or MNC, you know, I'm just, I'm curious what your, um, the, the citizenship requirements would be for you guys, if they're the same as everybody's, or if they're different in some way? Ours is the same as the uh, other three governing members, meaning Alberta, um, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. Uh, all, all of us, all four of our governments, we regularly run our uh, citizenship list 
through the Indian registry to ensure that people aren't um, actually res registered First Nations. Um, it, I'm under the uh, impression, and um, I've recently been told Manitoba does not do that. They do not run their citizenship through the Indian registry. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a very solid registry. We've been known as one of, one of the most solid registries in, in, in the um, out of the governing members for years. We've had um, other registry um, staff work with our registry staff to see how we do things. Uh, we're very proud of our registry and um, very proud to say that we're, we're compliant with all the requirements. You, I do know, sorry, go ahead, finish. Um, I do know that um, Manitoba Métis Federation in their recent self-governing agreement, uh, one of the clauses states that you cannot be registered with another provincial Métis uh, government. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, I'm not sure how they're going to comply with that. Um, I know they have signed up a few people in British Columbia, but I'm not sure how they're going to comply with their own uh, federal self-governing agreement. Um, because um, t to date, I've, I haven't heard of any um, anybody reach out to our registry to see if that um, a, a citizen is uh, registered with us and MMF. So um, I'm curious to see how that's going to um, um, play out and how they're going to be in compliance with their own um, federal agreement. Interesting. Well, uh, Lisa, we thank you for joining us today. Give us a little insight into what's uh, what's cooking over in the Métis Nation of British Columbia for 2022. Happy New Year to you. Thank you. On to Alberta now, where some Siksika Nation members began the new year with new digital skills and information technology. Those new skills come in handy with rural connectivity challenges and remote learning. Tamara Pimentel has more. The digital divide is very real for First Nations. It's uh, something we, we face um, every day. With the pandemic comes many technology challenges on Indigenous communities, from online schooling to just poor wireless connection. But on Siksika Nation, the information technology sector got a boost when 25 of its members completed training. David Pantherbone is with the IT department at Siksika Health. Um, there's a lot of challenges the pandemic has brought. We're working on an internet connectivity project to actually bring um, fiber and uh, enhance our wireless um, on the reserve here to, to kind of combat that digital divide. The program was brought on by the Blackfoot Tech Council and CompTIA, a nonprofit for the IT industry. 15 trainees are in paid practicums with other departments on the nation. For tribal manager Richard Sparvier, an IT specialist that understands the challenges of living on reserve, goes a long way. Easier way to connect with somebody who you potentially know or might know through, uh, you know, another family member or friend than it would be to connect with somebody who's, you know, many miles away on the phone or something else. You know, it's uh, a bit more personalized. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. Well, still to come, sad news for hockey fans. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And after a large and tasty holiday dinner, our loyal viewer Sandra shared with us a picture of Pablo the cat. Pablo beat her to the couch for some rest and relaxation. Keep those great photos coming by sending them to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, plus one in Halifax, minus two in St. John's, minus 25 for Kuduak, 19 below with the sun in Nain, six below in Montreal, snow and minus 21 in Chibugamu, minus 11 in Sault Ste. Marie, snow and 15 below in North Bay, 17 below for Thunder Bay, minus 22 in Sioux Lookout, minus 24 in God's Lake and Norway House. Snow and 21 below for Winnipeg and Gimli, minus 20 in Dauphin. Snow and minus 10 for Regina, 16 below in Saskatoon. Minus 27 in Uranium City and La Ronge. 
in northern Alberta, snow and minus 30 for Fort McMurray, Peace River, and Grand Prairie. Minus 24 with snow in Edmonton, zero and snow in Medicine Hat. Plus three with showers in Vancouver, plus four with rain in Victoria. Minus 21 with snow in Prince George, 33 below in Deese Lake. Minus 32 in Old Crow, minus 37 in Watson Lake. Minus 21 for Yellowknife, 23 below and snow in Norman Wells. Minus 28 in Saks Harbor, 21 below for Politak. Minus 36 in Whale Cove, 34 below for Baker Lake. Minus 26 in Resolute, 29 below with snow in Joe Haven. Well, as you saw there, depending on where you are, it may be hard to think about floods when everything is frozen. But spring will come again, and a new study has identified Indigenous communities that are hotspots for flood risk. The University of Waterloo study found 40 hotspot communities across eight provinces. The highest number of hotspots are located in BC at 13 and Ontario with 10. The number one hotspot is the Shimadawa First Nation in northern Manitoba. The study also found that 81% of First Nations in Canada had some flood exposure that impacted either population or residential properties. Well, some sad news about our NHL coverage. Hockey lovers hoping to watch the games in Plains Cree will have to wait. It was announced today that Hockey Night in Canada in Cree on APTN will be pushed back due to surging COVID cases. The program was set to air on APTN next weekend. The deal with Sportsnet is the first of its kind and features four Cree commentators. The broadcast now will kick off on March 5th for the Vancouver and Toronto game, barring any other pandemic delays. Unfortunate news indeed. Well, coming up shortly is the first episode of Nation to Nation for the new year. Host Brett Forrester has Mary Simon, Canada's first Indigenous Governor General, as his guest. In this preview, Simon talks about how, after she first attended a day school, she avoided being sent to a residential school. A lot of my friends were sent out to residential school, but because my father married my mother, who was a unilingual Inuk woman, um, we were told we weren't eligible to be educated, so we never went to residential school. In fact, my father was our teacher for, for the next few years during my high school. We were homeschooled, so... Um, in that, during that time, it was difficult, but in hindsight, it's probably the best thing that happened to me. And you can catch that entire interview and more on Nation to Nation with Brett Forrester in less than two minutes' time, right here. That is all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Thursday. For news anytime, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. Never miss a headline by downloading the APTN News app. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great night.